Welcome to Reading Around Macroeconomics. My name is Emil Kalinowski, and I am bringing an article to you today from Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. The article we're going to be reading, I'm going to be reading, you're going to be listening to, is posted on the 17th of September at Alhambra Investments, and it is called Dollar Warning Updates from the Islands, which started it. Jeff is going to tell us about the latest data from the Tick Report, Treasury International Capital, and a very interesting prehistory about the Caribbean and its importance to the global dollar system, the shadow system. The first seeds of the eventual euro dollar bloom in domestic US terms were sown all the way back in 16, as in the year 1916. Believe it or not, the Federal Reserve Act, then only a few years old, had been modified so that banking syndicates, those able to raise the princely sum of one million capital, could form what were called agreement corporations. What was the agreement? Like the arrangement in London many years later, which would make the euro dollar into all it could be, and then some, U.S. agreement corporations would be relatively free of regulation, provided that their exclusive focus and customer base didn't include any domestic Americans or American businesses. These were given an upgrade, kind of, in 1919, when only three such corporations were incorporated in the first three years allowed. New Jersey Senator Walter Edge proposed and sponsored yet another amendment to the Federal Reserve Act, permitting what would from then forward until the early 80s, be called Edge Act corporations, or edges. Not surprisingly, these didn't catch on either, at least not until the late 50s. There were a handful set up in the 50s, according to contemporary Fed sources, which grew to 38 by 1964. Fast forward to 1976, suddenly 122 were registered. Just why was there a great inflation again? In many ways, these were pure farce. To qualify, a bank or bank holding company needed only create what were originally labeled Nassau shells after the city in the Bahamas. Open an office there or somewhere else in the Caribbean, since the islands scattered throughout the region are some of the fine places located pretty close to the U.S. mainland, throw a brass plate name on the door, put a few low-level staff inside connected by direct line to HQ, and voila, a foreign bank. Once the shell was in place, the domestic institution could ramp up its offshore dollar activities, which by the late 60s had grown to become massive, even disruptive, for the Fed, money. Eurodollar banks held no such restrictions, and so large commercial banks ended 1968 and began 1969 with huge deposit outflows. If that were the end of the story, the Fed might have been quite happy with the result, tightening, after all. But instead, those large banks simply borrow those deposits back from London, mostly, in the form of Eurodollar liabilities. By the end of 1969, large commercial banks saw their liability balances in large CDs decline by half to $11 billion, while Eurodollar borrowing balances grew by $13 billion. These were very large numbers for the time. This right here specifically accounts for what you see on the chart below. And the chart below is a word count of the, of the words euro dollar appearing in FOMC statements in the 1960s. And they rise from nothing to very frequent. Officials were reluctantly forced to begin reckoning with this real money system, even if a decade and a half after it first shot up. The entire official story of the Great Inflation needs to be completely rewritten, sadly, in large part because of the Paul Volcker myth, 
a lot of good and actually honest scholarship, including much undertaken underneath the Federal Reserve's banner, was just thrown away in the garbage and forgotten. And not because it was bad research drawing improper or irrational conclusions. On the contrary, this stuff was discarded simply because it became dangerously inconvenient to the burgeoning Volcker myth of the all-powerful central bank wielding expectations policy rather than effective money. One such taste from June 1975 comes from a fella named Richard Debs, who just so happened to be the FRBNY's chief administrative officer at the time. <clears throat> Finally, for the sake of logic, I should mention the legal framework of the Eurodollar market, since I included the Eurodollar market in my working definition of international banking from the point of view of the United States. However, I'm afraid that I can't do much more than just mention it. The Eurodollar market itself is not easily definable, and its legal framework if any, is even less so. The market grew rapidly without the assistance or burdens of an integrated or even coordinated set of laws. It is an international or multinational or transnational phenomenon, but it is regulated only to the extent that the euro-dollar activities of the institutions operating in that market, the euro banks, are subject to regulation and supervision by the national jurisdiction in which they operate. The train had been set in motion way back in 1916, but only gained serious steam when the euro-dollar market itself reached a critical mass 40-some years later. While London predominated, there was always a significant euro-dollar center in the far sunnier Caribbean right next door. This only began to change after May 2011, the devastation of Eurodollar number two. In some cases, banks, breastplates, were relocated while many others, from what I can tell, just disappeared as operations were scaled down or shut entirely once the offshore money world realized Eurodollar number one wasn't going to be the only one. QEs were for the suckers. Caribbean redistrib redistribution, however, regained some of its luster, ironically, during 2018's Eurodollar number no. 4. Though the nature of this rebound remains shrouded in data discontinuity and further mystery to this day, if you're interested, it had to do with CLOs and repo collateral. The Treasury Department, curiously, suddenly interested in island custody and the weaknesses in the data collection surrounding all that. The renewed love affair with the Caymans at all was short-lived, though it remains as firm as ever, from what little I can tell, from Mr. Emil Offshore Slickster. What? Ever since March 2020, that GFC2 for which J. Powell can't congratulate himself enough as to his janitor skills, again, the diminishing island dollars. This retreat took a more determined turn back in December 2020, just as everything was ready get, to get into going perfectly the right way. And not just Caribbean, also Japanese, another key non-European offshore dollar center. Two considerable offshore nodes turned sharply the wrong way, just in time for the dollar to stop crashing early in January. It is oftentimes difficult to see and appreciate these things, and not just from a data, lack thereof, standpoint. From the vast, for the vast majority of the public, even all these decades later, there's stuff offshore? Huh? This is the real legacy of Volcker, who was himself totally fooled. As noted a few months ago, going along with the Caribbean-Japan tick, 
Treasury International Capital Data Report. From late 2020, dollar shortage type warning signs have only escalated ever since despite reflationary, then inflationary hysteria gripping pretty much the entirety of financial commentary along the way. Yes, 5% CPIs and whatnot, but there's a reason they likely have peaked already, as well as when they may have. By May 2021, a rare net negative in total monthly transactions for long-term U.S. dollar assets, foreigners reported to Treasury that on net, they had sold more long-term U.S. dollar long-term U.S. dollar assets than they had bought. This deflationary warning discussed in great deal here, and he links to another article. The correlation is historically validated and obvious. A deep history of selling treasuries that goes back to those earliest days of Bahami Bahamian brass plates. While the net rebound in June, I wrote last month, this wasn't unusual following a decline and didn't really mean much unless there was more net buying continuing forward. Instead, Treasury reported yesterday another net negative for July, making it two out of the last three. Japanese and Caribbean players suddenly get pulled back to end last year. Dollar goes up. Tips break evens invert and then the amplified aftermath of the otherwise little tri trivial Fedwire. Reflation dies in the bond markets, RRP, T-bill collateral shortages, and now two of the last three months, same months as when, for example, bond yields declined the most, most recently, indicating that a huge chunk of this shadowy offshore system is experiencing some kind of non-inflationary spasm, renewed non-inflationary spasm. The chain predates, obviously, Delta COVID as well as any of the other mainstream excuses running around, and it fits equally obviously with the monetary background behind what is shaping up to be transitory price pressures, therefore not inflation. Unfortunately, everything I've written up here would be shocking news to the vast majority, 99.999999% of the public who quite understandably looks at these 5% CPIs and thinks, well, Jay Powell said he printed a lot ton of money. On the contrary, that's the post Volcker myth being stretched as far as possibly, as far as it possibly can stretch. It's not you can, it's not what you can see which matters in these money meaning economy matters. It's what you can't or for what don't even you, or for what don't even know you should be looking. It's not what you can see which matters in these money meaning economy matters. It's what you can't or for what don't even know you should be looking. Central bankers had a choice in the late 70s and early 80s either do their job and follow the offshore money by diving headfirst down the rabbit hole to try to sort it all out, or ignore it entirely, pretend none of it exists, and then hope by stroke of luck it won't matter that central banks gave up on money all those decades ago. Their luck didn't run out in August 2007. Ours did. We're still paying in deflationary offshore currency for the ignorance. Well, that was very interesting, very interesting. I like how Jeff brought in this fascinating story about the edge corporations from the turn of the last century. Fascinating and unbelievable. Two out of the last three months of available data were in September. Who knows what it was for August already and where we are for September. Two of the last three available months, net negatives. This is a flashing siren the, a warning warning as jeff makes clear i wanted to apologize for flubbing a few of those lines i'm not going to go back and edit it i've got to move forward i've got naps to take i've got tans to
to get. I've got a massage to go to. So forgive me. Forgive me. Okay. It's not perfect. I'm going to do better. I went to a public university, Arizona State University. They did not beat us with rulers. Mother, Sister Mary Margaret was not standing over me with a ruler beating me whenever I would mispronounce or not enunciate properly. And now you have to pay the price, like we all have to pay the price for central bankers ignoring the vast majority of money and letting it do whatever it wants. Well, I'm gonna be back tomorrow I hope you learned something from this and leave a comment in the show notes if you have any suggestions.